the early Christians set up communities, what we call churches, that had everything. And there was no, nothing like it in the world. That is, they had schools, they were educational, they had welfare programs, they were freeing slaves from the second and third centuries. Uh, they were starting hospitals, they were caring for one another. And whenever they were beaten up and killed, they smiled sweetly. And people were just amazed that there was this alternative club that had the whole of life in view. It's, it's a thousand years almost between Jesus and the first crusade. A lot happened. Uh, I mean, it is a thousand years, just over a thousand years. And uh, a lot happened. And when, when the Crusades eventually burst onto the scene, uh, Christians were so captured by their own culture in that period and not captured enough by the original uh, gospels that, uh, that, they, that they should have been captured by. The recurring theme through my book is that Jesus wrote a beautiful melody. And sometimes Christians have performed it terribly right out of tune and other times they've sung it beautifully but the only way to have any hope of singing it beautifully is to be listening to that beautiful melody all the time the gospel of jesus christ Hello there. Welcome to the Conversations at the Desk. Today in conversation with me is the Australian historian, Dr. John Dixon. Dr. Dixon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Dixon holds a PhD in ancient history from Macquarie University. He's an author, speaker, historian, and media presenter. Dr. Dixon is author of more than 20 books, two of which became television documentaries. He also co-hosted the documentary For the Love of God, how the church is better and worse than you ever imagined. Dr. Dixon teaches a course on the historical Jesus at the University of Sydney in Australia, where he also researches the origins of Christianity in the Roman Empire. He's a visiting academic in the Faculty of Classics at the Oxford University and a distinguished fellow and senior lecturer in public Christianity at Ridley College, Melbourne. And Dr. Dixon presents Australia's number one religion podcast called Undeceptions, exploring aspects of life, faith, history, or ethics that are either much misunderstood or mostly forgotten. We're so, so glad to have with us, have him with us today on our show to discuss uh, his recent book, Bullies and Saints, an honest look at the good and evil of Christian history. I must say, Dr. Dixon, this was a very provocative and challenging read in you know, it was also kind of disturbing as well. Uh, mm. But at the same time, I think uh, if you are a Christian or if you're a skeptic as well, if you've really thought about this issue, this is the book that you must have on your shelf. Um, we will go through it here. You know, Dr. Dixon very skillfully breaks down the complex history of the church. Uh, so Dr. Dixon, while we start, uh, it's usually the case that as Christians, we really like to talk about the saints, the saints of his Christian history. Uh, while the secular attacks at religion are almost always aimed at the bullies, right? Mm. What led you to write a book that, you know, kind of explores both sides of the pendulum uh, of the Christian history? Well, I guess there's a theological reason, and that is Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye, then you'll be able to see the speck in another person's eye. And so from the beginning, uh, followers of Jesus ought to be expert at noticing the log or plank in the eye um, and freely admitting it and taking it out. That's the theological. Um, the practical is increasingly, if we want to communicate with people who are highly skeptical about Christianity, um, I think we have to be honest that they have some pretty good complaints. They're not just making things up when they talk about the Inquisitions or the Crusades or, you know, w whatever other evils, uh, colonialism and so on. Uh, these really are aspects of uh, Christianity's expansion around the world. So it seemed to me practically uh, a necessity to offer an even-handed, uh, no-holds-barred, uh, 
uh, account of uh, the bullies and the saints of Christian history, asking the question all the way along uh, whether the particular ba behavior I'm describing, whether a bully or a saint, is in harmony with what Jesus expected, or is it in discord with what Jesus taught? Yes. Um, so, I mean, before we actually explore the kind of laws of Christian history, what I really like about the book is the use of contrast. Uh, when we are already, you know, sometimes at some stages in your book, I was, all, I was kind of glad to see the good things that Christianity has done, and then immediately kind of contrast it with uh, the evil that followed. So there's always this, you know, waxing and waning that we see in Christian history. So why don't we just kind of start with the, uh, the positives? And I think Lord has been uh, said and written about the positive aspects of Christianity in the history of the world. I think even uh, secular historians like Tom Holland have been, uh, you know, out there talking about this in academia. Why don't you just kind of take us through the positives of Christianity first, and then we'll go through some of the ugly things. It is fairly uncontroversial to say that um, Christianity gave the early Western world, that is, the world to the west of, say, uh, Syria, um, the notions of charity for all, uh, the idea that every human being is inestimably and equally valuable because they're all made in the Imago Dei, the image of God, um, the ethic of humility, that is sacrificing your status for the good of another out of love, um, these things only came into Western culture uh, because of the teaching of Jesus and before Jesus, of course, the Judaism from which Jesus uh, brought most of his riches. Um, Jesus, in a sense, universalized and intensified the justice and compassion and humility ethic of the Judaism before him. Um, and these, these spread throughout the West. Uh, these were not values in Greece or Rome. They were not values in Gaul, uh, you know, France. They were not values up in Saxony, or what we call Germany today. Uh, they were revolutions. And we can track it empirically. This is not just theory. We can see the first hospitals flourish under the Christians in the, in the first few centuries. We can see the first charitable programs develop. And they're all Christian. And then we can see them spreading west with the church as the church go, goes further and further west. Uh, so do the hospitals and the charities and the new vision of, of an ethic of humility. Um, so it should be uncontroversial to people who are not involved in apologetics, either skeptical apologetics or Christian apologetics, but just dealing with history, that Christianity gave these things to our Western world. That's the, that's the positive account. I think I might add just one more thing, and that is the, the notion that you can do great good in the world without power. Now, that was a completely novel idea in Greece and Rome. Uh, and the early Christians, certainly for the first 300 years, thought they didn't need any legislative or military power. They thought they'd already won because Christ had died and been raised and was at the right hand of God. So they've already won. And so they didn't need earthly power. They could just persuade, pray, serve and suffer and that would be enough to change the world. And they were right. And of course, the, the counterpoint to it is uh, they didn't pursue that policy for their whole history, as you well know. Right, I, I kind of like that point about, you know, the political power, which kind of comes later uh, when Rome um, adopts Christianity. But before that, if you talk about the first three centuries, I think you touched on this um, just a moment ago. But what really then this kind of accounts for the miraculous rise in this period? I think this is kind of unprecedented in terms of any movement with no armed weaponry or political uh, power to back it up. I think at one point you actually mentioned that most well-known historians or I think uh, of, or scholars of classics actually describe this as a, a miraculous rise. What, what, hmm. what kind of explains that? Yes, well, I mean, Edwin Judge is probably the greatest classicist Australia has ever produced. He is on the world stage, one of the, the greatest scholars of the Augustan period, the Emperor Augustus. 
Um, and uh, and he's the one who who once said to me uh, that what the early Christians pulled off in those first few centuries is nothing short of miraculous. But he didn't actually mean it was miraculous. He he just meant there's no earthly explanation. P- people have tried to explain it. I mean, I have books right here on my shelf. I just happen to be uh, looking at it at the moment. The the spread of Christianity in the first four centuries, right? Edited by W. V. Harris. Very important book. Collection of essays. Uh, trying to explain it. But, but in the end, you read that material and they're all just shooting in the dark. We have no idea. It's not like um, a, a normal revolution in history, which you can tie down to a particular riot or a particular assassination or a particular war. OK, you can't do that with early Christianity. It just um, something's going on beneath the surface in those first three centuries where what we know from the Greek and Roman side is Christians were hated and that the powers were executing them and punishing them, or at least sidelining and criticizing them. From the Christian sources, we know that they were just getting busy training up the masses in an incredible catechetical campaign of of studies for early Christianity. Uh, They were evangelizing, they were serving the poor and so on. So we know what they're doing we just can't explain it. Um, I mean, my, my own doctorate in an ancient history department was e- exploring the expansion of Christianity in the Roman world. And I can't tell you <laughs> what explains it. Um, it we, I can only tell you what they were doing. And if, and if you really pinned me down and said, no, no, you need an answer before I let you off this, this podcast, I think my answer would be something like the early Christians set up communities what we call churches that had everything and there was not nothing like it in the world that is they had schools they were educational they had welfare programs they were freeing slaves from the second and third centuries uh, they were starting hospitals they were caring for one another and whenever they were beaten up and killed they smiled sweetly and people were just amazed that there was this alternative club that had the whole of life in view. They weren't just a metal workers union. They weren't just a a philosophical club. Um, They were everything that you could imagine. And and I think people found that compelling, but that is a pure speculation. I can't can't, uh, test that thesis. That's quite interesting. I mean, this this whole, uh, uh, you know, first three centuries and, and the way both secular and Christian historians try to describe it, it's, it, one thing, the common thing that we, we probably agree upon is this, that the rise was indeed miraculous. Uh, so, uh, but then, yeah, so it began as a non-political movement, as you said, beneath the surface. Uh, but then what really went wrong and how? <laughs> well, uh, the, the easy answer, the answer that um, even I, perhaps 10 years ago, was very tempted by, uh, was to say it was Emperor Constantine. When Emperor Constantine in 312 becomes a Christian and uh, he, he um, forces Christianity on everyone. And so at the beginning of the fourth century, <clears throat> that's when everything goes bad because suddenly churches have power, suddenly they pick up the sword and so on. That story isn't true. Uh, the primary sources we have don't tell that story. That was a, it, was a cer- it was certainly an important turning point. Don't get me wrong. The emperor becoming a Christian um, was a was a miraculous event. Um, obviously, there were enough Christians in the empire for Constantine to feel that it wasn't a completely crazy idea. <clears throat> and apart from anything, he probably did have some kind of vision that spooked him and made him think he better do something about it. And he identified that with with the God of the Christians. Now, what he did is he made Christianity legal. And that was a big move. Okay. But, but he only gave Christianity the same privileges that the synagogues already had, that the pagan temples already had. So it's not that he um, privileged them and crushed everyone else. That, that's a myth. But he opened the floodgates and he did support them and give them tax breaks. And these were the same tax breaks, tax exemptions that synagogues had and pagan temples had. The difference was the Christians had these massive aid programs, charitable programs. Mm-hmm. They had large farms that were entirely dedicated to growing food for the poor. And because of these tax breaks, all of that work, of course, was amplified. 
So actually in a weird way, state sponsorship, or at least state allowance, state support mm. without state mandate was a, was a really helpful thing for the church. The church did enormous good. Now, if we go forward from Constantine, he, he dies in 337 AD. If we go forward right to the end of the uh, uh, fourth century to around the 380s, that's when we start to get this cliche of Christianity imposed on the Greek and Roman world. See, by that stage, you're probably getting close to a majority of Christians, or at, at least we might say by the end of the fourth century, we might say that there are perhaps 40% Christians. And because Christians were so active everywhere, uh, the emperors did start to feel that they could flex their muscles and push Christianity down on everyone else. And by the end of the fourth century, they did ban going to pagan temples. And so at the end of the fourth century, the church is made up of a lot of bullies. But even there, there's a paradox. The paradox is if you had asked, let's say, if we were in Milan in Italy in the late fourth century, say, let's say the year 390, the, the bishop of Milan uh, was St. Ambrose. Ambrose was a Roman governor and senator, and he was parachuted in to be a bishop. And he acted like a governor. <laughs> he acted like a Roman governor as bishop. But if you asked the poor in Milan, is Ambrose a bully? They would have said, don't be ridiculous. He's the champion of the poor. He's the one who allows us to have shelter and food. He cares for us. He loves us. But if you had asked an elite pagan in, the, in 390, is Ambrose a bully? They'd say, you bet. He's terrible. He, he took the statue of the God of victory down in the Senate house. He, he is stopping us from going to the pagan temples. Um, so can you, can you see that paradox? I don't know how to resolve it. The, the, the church with power was able to do more good and more evil. Right. I think before I kind of, you know, go to the next question that I have in mind, I wanted to actually go in a sequence, you know, through, through history. But because we are talking about the political side of, of, of Christianity, uh, now, you know, I'm talking from India, right? In India, we don't really have any sort of political privilege uh, or, um, you know, uh, you're not really some a group that would really influence politics as much. So it is the case with a lot of Eastern countries like China or be it Iraq all of these countries. But when you do com com compare the West with the Eastern churches, uh, where in the East, through persecution, still the movement is actually functioning kind of beneath the surface. Uh, the question that I have for you, and I think uh, several historians like Philip Jenkins have actually made this point, uh, that Christianity is kind of growing in the East. And one, one aspect of, of probably, we'd, maybe we can't kind of draw a direct correlation there, but uh, there's something about political privilege, priv privilege and political power that might also act against the growth or the goodwill that Christianity earns in the, in the, in the larger society. What do you uh, probably comment on that? I couldn't agree more, <clears throat> but I will return to my paradox. Um, the, the part that I do agree with is the very heartbeat of the Christian faith, what, what Christians call the gospel, is that God entered into the world as a humble human being, uh, lived the life none of us could live perfectly, uh, gave his life on a cross for us and rose again. So um, that whole uh, narrative trajectory is a rejection of power. It is laying down life. Uh, it, is, it is allowing the powerful Romans to conquer him. And he was put on a cross, the most shameful uh, form of death in the Roman world. So um, when Christians take up power and think that they can achieve God's ends using power and control, it is obviously a great clash and contradiction to the very center of the faith. And so a thoughtful non-Christian who sees Christians being bullies um, is, is likely to feel the discord to feel the contradiction. And I think that that is the sense in which um, Professor Jenkins and many others uh, are absolutely correct. 
the only the only thing I, I I want to the caveat I want to offer and and to return to my paradox, it doesn't always go badly. Um, it often does, and it often is repelling, but it doesn't have to, um, because the the when when churches are allowed power, and they are privileged, but they use it humbly for the sake of others, not for themselves, then that can go very well. And this is precisely what you see in, say, Cappadocia in uh, the 360s and 370s AD, where uh, the, the bishops, um, Bishop Basil of uh, Caesarea, uh, Gregory Nyssa, uh, these were elite men with the best education the empire could offer. Um, they, they, they had the ear of the secular powers but how did they use that power? These are the guys who started the first hospitals on a massive scale. Um, and, and those hospitals spread west uh, into Europe as a result of what they did. I only offer that not to justify the use of power, simply to not fall into the cliche. History is too messy to say, as soon as the church gets power, it goes corrupt. I have examples of it having power and letting go of power for the sake of others. And then it's a beautiful tune in the world. Thank you, that's a very helpful answer. I think you've actually connected the dots there pretty well. Um, now, this conversation cannot really move forward without talking about the Crusades. Um, hmm. You know, when you talk to skeptics, this is like a stone in the shoe for the Christian. When you look at Christian history, the amount of violence that was propagated in the name of Christ. So when you go back to the first century, Jesus standing before Pilate, the Roman governor, and he says that my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, I would have actually had men out there fighting for me. That was Christ's own words. But then you come down a couple of centuries, we have an army or we have men with clubs and swords under the banner of the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, so while Christ's teachings and the New Testament clearly do not endorse a theology of violence, how did we end up there? Yeah. Wow, that's a long story. I, I, th I think about 100 pages of my book are, uh, offer an explanation of that. Um, the, the early evidence is pretty clear that Christians were totally opposed to violence. In fact, in those early centuries, say in the second century, they wouldn't even accept you as a student, as a catechumen, if you were a soldier. Um, so, that was, you know, they were pretty much against uh, state violence. But of course, the Apostle Paul did say that the secular state bears the sword to punish the wrongdoer and bring justice in the world. Um, and he's, he writes that uh, when, of course, you know, it's, uh, it's people like Nero in the house. Um, and so uh, the Paul thought there was a valid use of force. Now, if you wind forward uh, into the centuries, the sort of the theoretical turning point is um, Saint Augustine, uh, who at the beginning of the fifth century, so let's just say about 400, the year 400, um, the, there's a lot of Christians in the empire and there are some marauding bandits in North Africa that are, that are picking off people and enslaving people. Um, and uh, he has to write to the secular officials about what is a just response, what is a valid response, because he was the great intellect and the secular rulers wanted to know what the great Augustine thought. And he begins to develop a, a, a theological theory of just war. And he lays out the principles for a just war. Now, what he's doing there is he's saying, look, in theory, the Apostle Paul in Romans 13 said the state can bear the sword to, to punish the evildoer. So then he thinks, okay, now the state actually likes Jesus Christ. <laughs> so what do we do now? Yes, Paul wasn't talking about a Christian ruler, but now we have Christian rulers. So what do we do? And so he laid out these principles and... Um, if the church had just followed those just war principles, um, history would have turned out very differently um, because Augustine said it should only ever be in self-defense. 
it should always be proportional, it should only be given by a, a valid authority, and that the war should be conducted always in a way that left the defeated party unresentful in loss. In other words, you, you cared for their humanity so much, you never did more, never did more than you had to do. Shock and awe was completely antithetical. Now, um, in a way that Augustine never intended, that at least solidified in the Christian West's mind that warfare under some circumstances was valid. Okay, that's the year 400. Now let's crawl west into the year, into 500 and 600 and 700, and suddenly you've got rulers who are becoming Christians who can vaguely remember that the great Saint Augustine said warfare under some conditions is valid, and they just assume that their warfare is valid, and you've got a snowballing effect. So by the time you get to, um, say, Charlemagne the Great, the, the greatest king of medieval Europe, um, he, he actually conducts wars into Saxon territory up in Germany and offers the Saxons um, baptism or the sword. He's, he's literally trying to convert them with the sword. Now, how did we get there? Right. Just war principles would never have envisaged that. St. Augustine would be tearing his hair out. Um, uh, but, but there you go. There's Charlemagne uh, in the year 800, shortly before the year 800, thinking that you can kill people if they don't want to become Christians. Now, interestingly, in that very period, um, and I've got a whole uh, chapter on this, one of his key advisors, Alcuin of York, um, actually gently rebukes Charlemagne the most powerful man in Europe, and says, no, 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 the way of Christ is persuasion and sweetness and gentleness. And Charlemagne actually changes his policy. So right in that, um, the, the late uh, uh, 700s, you've got these two traditions, a violent tradition and, and a genuinely Christian tradition. And then we need to go forward two and a half more centuries. And so this, this theory of just war has developed enough for lots of rulers to think there is such a thing as a just war for Jesus Christ. And suddenly uh, the um, emperor of the Byzantine empire, what we think of as Turkey now, which is a Christian empire, the continuation of the Eastern part of the Roman empire is under attack from Islam. Uh, the Muslim armies have already taken out uh, Syria and Israel and Egypt and North Africa. And now they're pushing further west up to Constantinople. And the emperor of Constantinople writes to the fellow Christians in Europe and says, will you please come help us? That's the beginning of the First Crusade. Um, and so lots of the people who participated in the First Crusade thought they were involved in a just war, thought that they were repelling Muslim aggression. Um, and, and scholars can debate whether or not it was a just war. That's, I don't really go into that, that sort of theological or philosophical judgment. But what I do know is that the crusade, whatever its motivations, ended up being conducted in a way that was despicable. They slaughtered Jewish villages along the way to the Holy Land. Um, they killed Orthodox Christians along the way for various reasons. And they slaughtered men, women, and children when they got to Jerusalem. Um, and, and this breaches every principle of just war. This is a long answer to a very good question, but, but it's, it's a thousand years almost between Jesus and the first crusade. A lot happened. Uh, I mean, it is a thousand years, just over a thousand years. And uh, a lot happened. And when, when the crusades eventually burst onto the scene, uh, Christians were so captured by their own culture in that period and not captured enough by the original uh, gospels that, uh, that, they, that they should have been captured by. Yeah, that's a, that's a short answer. I think uh, for those who are interested, this book, I mean, there's a chapter called Christian Jihad. The, 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 very, the mm. title itself is very provocative. And mm. I think that was the... That was the um, chapter that actually hit me most uh, because mm. you actually describe the horror that followed when Christians picked up the sword. Eventually, you know, whatever the reasons mm. were that motivated the Crusades in the first place, eventually what you were left off with is a very dark patch in the history of the church. Uh, now, let's pause and forward to the Middle Ages. Mm. 
Now, when we talk about the Middle Ages, I think even skeptics at, uh, at large, they, they really like to target the, the Middle Ages, what Christianity held back, um, you know, uh, the world mm. from progressing forward. Uh, so you raise an interesting point about the secular reading of Middle Ages as Dark Ages. Mm. So could you kind of please elaborate on this revisionist telling of history? And what are some of yes. the issues associated with it? I mean, the, the whole language that people use of the Dark Ages to describe anything from the year 500, when Rome has collapsed, uh, through to the year, say, 1500, um, and, and you've got the humanist movement, and people call that the Dark Ages, um, or they might narrow it to, say, you know, the year 700 to 1100 or, or, or whatever. Um, but we know that that expression was invented in the 1300s and it was first proposed innocently um, by a man called Petrarch who was merely just describing the loss of Roman culture, the loss of great writers like Cicero. And he thought that um, after Cicero, everything went dark. Um, but people picked up this dark ages and started to use it in an anti-Christian propaganda to describe that whole period. Interestingly, the Protestants are probably most to blame. And I say this as a Protestant, um, because when the Protestant reformers in the 1500s wanted to describe that period where the Catholic Church reigned supreme, they picked up this phrase that was quite new and called it the Dark Ages. So in a funny sort of way, it was the Protestant Church who gave us the cliche of a period of darkness in the church and in the world. But scholars have, of course, gone back and reviewed all of the evidence and read all the documents and looked at the inscriptions and the archeology. span And um, there's no way they were a dark ages. They, they were a period of um, great philosophical learning. It was a period when all of the uh, literature of Rome that, that scholars could get their hands on, the ancient classical literature, was being studied and copied. Uh, this is the period when schools were developed. This is the very period where right across Europe, uh, schools uh, were being offered to rich and poor boys and girls um, and eventually gave us our universities. I mean, how you could describe as dark ages, the very period that gave us the first universities is beyond me. Um, and these universities were were not rebellions against the Dark Ages. They, they were part of what the Middle Ages were all about, seeking to reform, seeking to learn, seeking to extend. Um, and so really anyone who thinks of that period as dark um, either doesn't know the period very well or is just being mis mischievous, uh, is, is just part of a propaganda campaign. Yeah, and I think there's also this, um, as you point out, there's also this proclivity within us to kind of justify our own times in mm. comparison with the past. And, <laughs> and that kind of happens all the time. So uh, moving forward uh, to, to modern history, uh, I think a lot has been said about colonialism or Western imperialism. And how would you actually respond to that? Because I maybe you're aware of what Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Um, yeah. And that was in the context of the British Raj. Yes, I mean, it's a perennial uh, problem. I, I don't know much about um, the, the history of the British in India. I mean, I, I come from Australia, which was founded as a convict colony by the British. Uh, and, and, and so we have our own um, mixed feelings about British Christianity. Um, but it's one of those things uh, that we talked about in the fourth century. Um, the, the church, when it is al allied to power, uh, can be tempted toward violence and crushing cultures uh, and, and all that is worst in, in human beings. Um, and the church, uh, when it's allied to power, but uses that power for others, can do extraordinary good. And I know in, in the Australian context, um, that is true. There, there were British Christians at the founding of Australia uh, who did incredible evil and, and crushed 
Indigenous people. They were part of the colonial project to move out Indigenous people and establish, you know, a sort of a Christian Europe here in, in Australia. And yet there were also Christians who served uh, the First Nations people and gave up their own land for them to live on, um, set up hospitals and schools specifically for Indigenous people. Um, and, and my question, whenever, whenever this topic comes up, and it's very sensitive here in Australia, and I bet it's sensitive in India, the question I want to put to people is, you've, you've read, if you have read the Gospels, the, the, the life of Jesus, um, which is truer to Jesus? The um, giving up one's power to serve or taking up power to crush? And I think anyone who's being fair-minded can work out what the answer to that question is. And therefore, I put it to people who are highly skeptical. What you really want the church to be is more Christian. That's, that's, that's your complaint. The church isn't Christian enough. A church allied to power and crushing people is not Christian enough. You need to call the church back to Christ. And um, sometimes the world does that, and, and that's true here in Australia. Um, secularists are often really good at, at highlighting the evils of the church and calling the church to repentance. I'm sure it's true in India. Uh, there are you know, um, people who are anti-church, and we, we should thank God for them if they really do identify evils that are true evils. And Christians should be the first to say, yes, that's me. We're the people who confess their sins every day. So we should be willing to, to be open about it. Um, but I, I would just add that actually there's a long tradition within the church itself of the church noticing the log or plank in our eye and, and reforming the church. In every century from, from you know, say the fourth century through to the modern period, there are always Christians who are leading the charge to reform the church, to make it more like Jesus Christ. Thanks, Dr. Dixon. I think in the last 35 odd minutes, you've actually, you know, we've kind of taken a tour through history. This is, hmm. <laughs> this is not an easy task, but now how do you actually put it in the context of our own times? And uh, for me, the, what the book was really helpful was to actually think, how do we actually use this to understand the church in our own day, right? Hmm. Uh, so if you look at, let's say the last couple of years itself, there have been several scandals that involving Christian leaders, pastors, and organizations that have rocked the church. It has yes. kind of, you know, um, uh, pushed back against the church's testimony, public witness. Mm. So given the two-sided history that we have discussed in the last few minutes, what are the, dis what are the lessons that we could use today to navigate through these issues? As I reflect on all of church history, and this relates to today as well. One of the key mistakes Christians make is trying to be too like, too much like their host culture. Um, and, and so if that's in the ninth century, Christians wanting to appeal to the warrior, warrior class by becoming a little more like warriors, uh, or in a modern context, preachers and churches that want to appeal to celebrity culture. And, um, you know, we turn preachers into rock stars because, you know, the world has its rock stars or its Bollywood act actresses and, and, and we have our preachers. Um, they, these are all, this is worldliness creeping into the church. And uh, th this, is, this is a death sentence to the church. Um, and the only antidote is to pick up the gospels and read and reread Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and look at our Lord in conversation, in interactions, look at how he used power, look at how he rejected secular power, uh, look how he was bold in debate and yet humble and gracious toward the sinners and ultimately gave his life on a cross for us. Um, that should shape uh, the Christian mentality more than the world does. When, when the church is influenced by worldly culture, trying to fit in with worldly culture, uh, mistakes arise. Um, but when we try and live according to the gospel of Jesus Christ and try and attune our lives to that beautiful tune, uh, that's when beautiful things happen. I mean, 
the recurring recurring theme through my book is that Jesus wrote a beautiful melody. And sometimes Christians have performed it terribly, right out of tune. And other times they've sung it beautifully. But the only way to have any hope of singing it beautifully is to be listening to that beautiful melody all the time, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's so touching and powerful, Dr. Dixon. Uh, while we come to a close, uh, this, this, this final question that I have for you. Given all the evil, right, that religion has done in general, but Christianity in particular, uh, especially in the last, let's say, 10 or 20 years, we have seen the rise of new atheism and the, let's say, the main point that they highlight is that religions have done evil, right? Mm. You know, it's, it's that one thing that they actually like to highlight. So given the evil side of, of religion in general, do you think that a world without religion, without Christianity, per se, would be any better? No, and it would be worse. Um, the thing that is obvious uh, to anyone who knows history is that you didn't need the church to start wars and to conduct torture. Greece and Rome were doing beautifully on the torture and warfare front before the church came along. So you don't need the church. Um, the evils of the church are really just the evils that are common to all of humanity everywhere. Um, and, and I often point out the, the, the peculiar contribution of Christianity isn't violence and warfare. That's everywhere in human culture. But what is? What is the uncommon contribution of Christianity to culture? I think the answer is obvious. It's an ethic of humility. It's a, a, a doctrine of the image of God in every human being so that absolutely everyone, regardless of capacity, is inestimably and equally worth uh, you know, something to God and to us. And it is this ethic of charity, that grace, that I treat people not as they deserve, but better than they deserve, because that's exactly how God has treated me. Now, the Christians haven't always followed those things, but they are unique things. They were not there in Greece and Rome. They were not there in Syria and so on. And so really, um, we, we would just be left with our humanity in all its baseness. Uh, without Christianity. There's no way we'd be better off without without Christianity. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Dixon. And thank you for coming on the show and, you know, unpacking this very complex issue. Would you have some final comments on how, you know, Christians should take these kind of questions in, in public? Let's just be honest. All truth is God's truth. And so if there's, if, if there are skeletons in the closet or bodies that are buried, we shouldn't, we shouldn't worry when people dig them up. And, and we should be the first to admit our failings. But let's also be honest about the terrific gifts that the gospel gives to culture. The image of God in every human being, that God himself is humble toward us and loves us and gave himself for us. Hold those things in mind and go out into the world living them. And that's where the power is. Just today, I was reading a famous quote by Leslie Newbigin. I don't know if Bishop Leslie Newbigin is still well known in India, but he spent decades in India uh, in, I think, the 40s and 50s, uh, maybe the 60s. Um, but, but he said uh, that the best hum hermeneutic of the gospel, the thing that it, it interprets the gospel, he said, he says, is a Christian community that believes the gospel. So ultimately, the best apologetic is a Christian community captivated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Thank you again for coming on, on the show and uh, walking us to this topic, answering our questions. We really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you and God bless you.